Osaka, the second biggest city in the world's second biggest economy. Each year, this single Japanese city generates goods and services worth nearly $700 billion. At first glance, Osaka seems as prosperous and powerful as ever. But peel away the glitz and you can find Osaka and Japan's dirty little secret. A legacy of government mismanagement and economic decay. It was a failure fundamentally of management and of political leadership that took us from a, a big blowout to a crisis of dimensions that we haven't seen for seven or eight decades. It's 5 a.m. in Kamigasaki, a short drive from the city centre. Thousands of unemployed men have gathered in a vain search for work. Kamigasaki is a world away from the popular image of Japan. Many of these men helped build Japan's wealth, or what's left of it. They came here as day labourers for the construction industry. At one time, work was plentiful, but a decade of economic stagnation has taken its toll. えっと、特にうん、以前はあ、日雇い労働者、あで、え、仕事がないために野宿をする。ま、今まで会社に勤めていた人、え、工場で働いていた人、え、それからセールスマンをやっていた人。In a nearby park, some of Osaka's 15,000 homeless queue for a free meal. It's the only food some of them will get for several days. Volunteers do the work. The government provides virtually nothing. The men speak of resignation. <laughs> Their bitterness and shame is all too clear. The poverty and misery here reflects the folly of Japan's past, but it's also a portent of its future. Many Japanese people simply don't believe this problem exists, but they won't be able to ignore it for much longer. It's going to get a lot worse. The Japanese economy is in serious trouble, and a large part of the problem is the industry that once employed many of these men, construction. Successive Japanese governments have tried to revive the anemic economy by pouring trillions of dollars into public works. The tactic has backfired, and its legacy is a nation that has now been crushed under a mountain of debt and a landscape littered with roads, dams and bridges that make no economic sense at all. In a land full of white elephants, the biggest and whitest is an hour's drive from Osaka. The Akashi Bridge is the longest, tallest, most expensive and most pointless suspension bridge ever built. This is one of the most wasteful 
examples of public works in this country, they chose the most expensive type. And I just, uh, there was a tunnel at the entrance and uh, they didn't have to dig the tunnel. Just all they have to do is just go over the hill. So they made the cost uh, ever higher. Akio Ogawa is one of Japan's leading experts on public works. He says that despite all the yen and all the concrete that has been poured into the bridge's construction, hardly anyone uses it. It's a bridge to nowhere, linking Japan's main island, Honshu, with Shikoku, a much smaller island with a shrinking population, described in guidebooks as a rural backwater. What's even more remarkable, though, is that there were already two other bridges connecting the island. Engineers wanted just one bridge along this uh, small inland sea. But uh, there are three prefectures facing this uh, inland sea, so people, uh, especially politicians and business people, wanted uh, uh, their own bridge. So there are now three. The men who built the bridge expected it to generate extra traffic, but all it's done is take business away from the once thriving ferry industry. Local jobs have been lost and traffic is sparse, but there's an even bigger problem weighing on this bridge. The authority that built it now has debts totaling 4 trillion yen. They're the most expensive concrete per square foot ever in humanity. They're on a delusionary scale of the dimension of the pyramids. The bridge to nowhere is not the construction industry's only delusion. Japan has been addicted to concrete for decades, and despite these tough economic times, it refuses to kick the habit. Across the nation, massive tunnels are being carved out of mountainsides, where perfectly adequate ones already exist. Major freeways are being built between minor villages, and riverbeds are being concreted to make the water run better. Depending on how you calculate, it, we're close to 60% of the entire coastline lined with concrete at this point. Alex Kerr has spent the last 30 years watching the countryside get concreted over. He's written two best-selling books on Japan's fading beauty. Kerr points out that Japan now spends 30% more on public works than America, Canada, Germany, France, Italy and Britain combined. That means that Japan is essentially laying 30 times the amount of concrete per square foot that America does in one year. And there are plans on the drawing board that make the Akashi Bridge look like a drop in the ocean. Our latest uh, national development program uh, envisages a uh, new capital city and, uh, well... A new it, capital city? Yes, new capital city. Uh, Some place uh, uh, far away from Tokyo. Well, they argue that uh, Tokyo is too crowded and uh, so they need a new capital. After the Second World War, this frenzy of construction made perfect sense. But these days, it's in no one's interest, except the politicians. Traditionally, a certain percentage, it's often said 3% of most government construction projects, the money flows into the coffers through bribes and paybacks and other ways of the pol political parties. So Japan's political parties, all of them, not just the LDP, are funded through construction. And the people that wield the real power are in on the act too. There are 70,000 bureaucrats working in the land and transport ministry. They control 80% of the public works budget. 
one of the sources of, the, of Japan's corruption is the fact that the bureaucracies of Japan are allowed to profit from the businesses under their control. People from the construction ministry own some of the companies who build and manage the dams and who are given uh, contracts with, uh, with no bidding. Uh, then after retirement, they, they then are hired as amakudari, you know, that expression that means it, dropped from heaven, it. yes. So after retirement, they're then hired by construction firms. This iron triangle of bureaucrats, politicians and business has pushed one of the world's richest countries to the brink of financial ruin. Because of its public work spending, Japan now owes more money than any other country in history. The national government can print money. So, well, yes, but uh, in the other sense, if this is a company, a private company, it's uh, all, already uh, bankrupt. Add on the debts of public corporations, such as the one responsible for the Akashi Bridge, and the amount of money owed becomes truly mountainous. The problem is that the mountain of debt could explode at any time, and it's up to this man to defuse the situation. Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi is a rarity in Japanese politics. He's the first Japanese leader to have a perm, the first to be divorced, and the first to render schoolgirls weak at the knees. But most significantly, he's the first to declare war on the construction state. Koizumi has promised to cut Japan's debt by slashing public work spending, even if that means taking on his own political machine. But despite his huge popular support, the political forces aligned against him are powerful, more powerful perhaps than the Prime Minister himself. The current Prime Minister has in a sense been like a, a breath of oxygen. At least he said, we've got to change course. The real issue is, is he going to be able to do it? Does he have the power within his party to change course? That is still, at best, a very moot point. To see just how moot, we traveled to Nagano, northwest of Tokyo. A popular tourist destination, Nagano was host to the 1998 Winter Games. New venues, freeways, and train lines were built at massive cost. But now the stadiums stand empty, and the city has debts totaling more than $10 billion. In desperation, Nagano has turned to its own version of Junichiro Koizumi, Yasuo Tanaka, independent candidate, racy novelist, and media darling. During the campaign, Tanaka promised a new era of openness, and he's been true to his word, moving his office to the ground floor and behind glass so that the public can see him at work. It's very open-minded, like this crystal room. So uh, local people just come here to the hall and see, oh, what kind of uh, people talking with Mr. Tanaka. And the newspaper will write tomorrow morning what kind of discussion. I will now uh, remaking uh, Japanese democracy, I think. Like Koizumi, Tanaka is trying to take a wrecking ball to the construction industry. Most controversially, the governor has pulled the plug on plans for nine dams. It's a very mountainous prefecture, so we have a lot of uh, concrete dams. And uh, on the other side, and uh, now our prefecture, we have a very tragic one trillion six hundred billion yen of debt. It's a debt. High up in the mountains that surround Nagano, there's a piece of land that has been untouched by the construction industry until now. Shiobara-san is an anti-dam activist and strong supporter of Governor Tanaka. His research the devastating impact construction would have on the environment and the fact that scientists say the ground here is not stable. 
The dam's supporters say it's necessary to prevent a once in a hundred years flood, even though the river itself is hardly a raging torrent. Tanaka might be a hero with the public, but his decision has put him at odds with the shadowy men who run Japan's construction state. Tomotsu Shimozaki is one of Tanaka's fiercest critics in the local assembly. He also happens to run a construction company. Kyudamo <laughs> Governor Tanaka doesn't have the numbers on the local assembly, and his enemies have put the dams back on the agenda. In Nagano, they've basically lost the battle. The local prefectural councilmen and the construction ministry itself, the actual bureaucrats of the central ministry, have joined hand in hand to fight this thing, and they've pretty well succeeded because the, the governor cannot move without the support of the prefectural uh, council. Junichiro Koizumi is preparing for a similar battle with the Iron Triangle, and the stakes are even higher. The economy is contracting, confidence is waning, and the stock market keeps sliding. It's shed one quarter of its value since the Prime Minister took over. To get to where we have to be, the Prime Minister is going to have to break some of the alliances that brought him to power and make alliances with people who are on the other side of the aisle. If he can do that while well, keeping a position as a majority prime minister and then push through these reforms, Japan has a chance to pull this off without a real implosion. But this is really the last chance. It's five minutes to midnight and the clock is ticking. The problem has become so serious that no matter what road Japan takes, many more people will end up in places like Kamigasaki. If the government fails to treat the concrete cancer, its debt will keep growing, and economic decay could turn into economic collapse and social dislocation. But if the new Prime Minister does turn off the cement tap, then the consequences could be just as dire. It's an addiction, and Japan at this point, I mean, I think it's like a, it's heroin. Japan is well and truly addicted to these public works, and the pain of, uh, of coming off that addiction is going to be severe. I truly think the entire society would collapse, and everybody knows that, because at this point, the economy well and truly depends on the construction. Uh, you'd have tens of millions of people out of work. It would be absolutely devastating. Thank you.